AP Psychology students, today is the day. Today we are going to go over the different parts of an AAQ. All right, so on the AP exam, you will have to answer one article analysis question, which will have you summarize one peer-reviewed source. College Board recommends that you take 25 minutes to answer your AAQ and spend 10 of that 25 minutes on reading the prompt and study. Now, of course, it is up to you on how much time you take. Just remember, though, you only have 70 minutes in total to answer both the AAQ and the EBQ. Now, AAQs have six parts to them, and the nice thing here is only three of the six parts will actually change from year to year, which is honestly awesome because that means you can walk into this test knowing exactly what to expect. Every AAQ is formatted exactly like this. The only thing that changes from year to year is the highlighted areas, which change based on the prompt and research. Now, before we break down each part, of the AAQ, I want to remind you that when answering an AAQ, make sure that you use complete sentences. Many of your answers do not need to be essays, but you should have more than just one or two words. Also, make sure you spend some time reviewing the concepts from Unit 0 before taking an AAQ. You want to be familiar with the research methods, the ethical guidelines, parts of an experiment, and be able to connect the core skills to the different units of this class. So when you get to the AAQ, Q on the national exam, I would first read the prompt and the different parts of the AAQ before going on to read the peer-reviewed study. This will help you see what the focus of the AAQ is going to be, so that when you are reading the peer-reviewed study, you can be on the lookout for the key variables, statistics, ethical guidelines, and any other information that you will need for the AAQ. Oh, and when reading the AAQ, make sure you highlight, underline, and mark up the document and the AAQ itself to help you focus on the key terms and concepts that you need to be focusing on. All right, so now that we've talked about an overview of an AAQ, let's focus on each part. Starting with A, identify the research method used in the study. We can see actually for part A, there's only seven answers that you can give. But before we do that, I just want to remind you that if you need more help practicing AAQs, you can check out my Ultimate Exam Slayer, which has practice AAQs for each unit. Plus, it comes with two full practice AP exams, unit exams, in AAQs, AP exam tracker, and more. The course also has a new exam simulator that allows you to take AP tests just like the real exam. And the best part of the new simulator is that it gives you detailed feedback when you are done, showing you exactly what topics or units you got wrong, how long you spent on each question, and explanations for each answer, helping you see why each answer is either right or wrong to make sure you fully understand the content. This way, you can focus your studies on the areas you you are struggling with instead of just trying to review everything at once. All right, now let's go back to the AAQ. Starting with A, identify the research method used in the study. We can see actually for part A, there's only seven answers that you can give. You can say the research method used in the study was correlational research, a case study, a naturalistic observation, a meta-analysis, an experiment, or you could say it's a cross-sectional or longitudinal. Notice that four of those research methods are non-experimental options. One is an experimental option, and two are design options for a research method. Also notice that for part A, this is an identified question, so your answer only needs to be a sentence. You do not need to do a big in-depth explanation here. Now before we move on to part B, I do want to point out that for part A, if you're going to use longitudinal or cross-sectional as an answer, you also want to connect to one of the experimental or or non-experimental options. Think of longitudinal and cross-sectional as adjectives. These are design options for a research method, which kind of narrows down the seven possible answers to really just five. Also, the College Board has said that the AAQs will focus on just one research method, so you don't need to worry about a trick question that uses mixed methods. Okay, so after you answer part A, you will move on to part B, which will have you state the operational definition for a variable in the study. Remember, operational definition definitions are specific definitions that allow other researchers to replicate the study or research. The operational definitions are generally quantifiable and specific, so everyone can see exactly what was done and how it was done. Now for part B, you need to make sure that you state how the variable is measured. Your answer needs to be precise. The nice thing with part B is that the AAQ will actually give you the answer you need for this part. You just need to find it. Once you find it, all you need to do is copy 
copy it over. Again, though, you need to have a complete sentence. If you want, you could word your answer in the following format. This way, you can still have a complete sentence and you can use the operational definition from the AAQ. All right, up next is part C, which asks you to describe the meaning of the identified statistic. Now, similar to part A, there is only certain types of statistics that will be used for this question, which again is nice because you know exactly what to expect here. For this part, the AAQ can ask you about the mean, median, mode, range, standard deviation, percentile rank, skewness, correlation coefficients, effect size, or statistical significance. So make sure you are familiar with all of those statistics. Also, when answering part C, remember that the task verb is described, so you cannot just identify the statistics being asked about. In your answer, you need to show how the statistic connects with the research, so make sure that your answer shows the reader that you understand what the statistics mean in the context of the research. After you describe the statistics, you will get to part D, which will have you identify at least one ethical guideline applied by the researcher. Now, you only have to identify one guideline in the study. And notice again, the task verb here is identify. So you don't need to have a long essay. Generally, you will find the answer to this part of the AAQ in the participants or methods section of the study. When looking for the ethical guidelines, look for one of these guidelines here. These are the ethical guidelines that you can use as one of your answers. This is just like part C and A. There's only so many answers that will work for this part of the AAQ. One quick note here is that when you are actually trying to identify an ethical guideline, you need to identify one that is part of the study, not one that you think could be part of it or should be part of it. You need to find the guideline in the study itself. Also remember, again, you only need to identify one. Don't waste time trying to put down multiple. Just pick one and go with it. Up next, we have part E, which is explain the extent to which the research findings may or may not be generalizable using specific and relevant evidence from the study. Right away, I want you to notice that this is an explain question, so you will need more than just one sentence. Also notice that when saying if the research findings are generalizable, you need to be able to support your answer with evidence from the study. You cannot simply say here that the findings from the study are generalizable. You need to explain in detail why. Now remember, generalizability is referring to the extent that the study can be broadly applied to the larger population that is being studied. So in answering this question, you need to figure out who is represented in the study and who is not represented in the study. Your answer to this question should really have two parts. The first part is you saying whether or not the study is generalizable. And the second part is your explanation as to why your first part is correct. For this part of the AAQ, you could answer the question by saying the study is generalizable, or you could answer it by saying the study is not generalizable. The factor that really is going to determine if you get the point or not is your explanation. And if you can connect to the evidence from the study to support your answer. All right, we made it to the last part of the AAQ, which is part F. Explain how at least one of the research findings supports or refutes the psychological concept or hypothesis of the study. Now, this is the only part of the AAQ that is worth two points, not one. So make sure you spend some time here and think through your answer. When answering this part of the AAQ, make sure you clearly state what the researcher found and explain how the results support support or refute the hypothesis or concept that the AAQ is asking about. One way you could frame your answer is first by stating if the conclusions of the study support or refute the hypothesis or concept stated in the AAQ. Then follow that answer up with an explanation connecting to the data, conclusions, or findings from the study to fully support your answer. All right, well, there you have it. That was a quick overview of the AAQ. Hopefully this video gave you a better idea on what to expect. Now comes the time though to practice. Go try and answer different AAQs. And when you're done, go through the rubric to see how you did. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time online.